Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks so much for listening to my podcast. If you like what you hear, please follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and also at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks so much for listening. Enjoy it. I'm so excited to discuss my sponsor today, which is Page One Books, because my summer book bundle is ready on pageonebooks.com. And the bundle that I've put together includes three books that I picked, uh, Montauk by Nicola Harrison, More Myself by Alicia Keys, and I Miss You When I Blink by Mary Laura Philpott, all of which have been on this podcast here. Uh, It includes a Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books beach tote, a cute little library card pencil slash cosmetic case, and a water bottle for staying hydrated plus a little... um, thing of sun lotion. So go to page1books.com, page one with the number one. So page number one books.com and check out my page one books summer bundle. Buy it as a gift, a housewarming, if you actually go somewhere or just give it to yourself. Everybody needs a treat. We've had a long spring. <laughs> page one books.com. Okay, don't get too sad, but today is the last day of my 10 days of a July book blast. I hope that you've enjoyed all these 10 days. And if you've missed them, go back and listen to Memoir Mondays and Debut Tuesdays and Body Blast and all the rest of the episodes that hopefully will have made your July just a little bit better. Today's our last day, and it's a self-help inspiration empowerment Friday. So let's just call it Empowerment Friday. I hope that you feel encouraged and inspired and just awesome after listening to these episodes today. Aminatel So and Anne Friedman are co-authors of the book Big Friendship, How We Keep Each Other Close. Aminatu is a writer, interviewer, and cultural commentary. She's a frequent public speaker whose talks and interviews lead to candid conversations about ambition, money, and power. Aminatu lives in Brooklyn. Anne Friedman is a journalist, essayist, and media entrepreneur. She's a contributing editor to The Gentlewoman. Every Friday, she sends a popular email newsletter. Anne lives in Los Angeles. They also co-host an insanely popular podcast called Call Your Girlfriend. Welcome, Anne and Aminatu. Welcome to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I'm so delighted to have you on today to talk about friendship. Thank you so much for having us. It's my pleasure. So can you please tell listeners what your book is about and what inspired you to write it? We are the authors of Big Friendship, How We Keep Each Other Close, which is a memoir of our decade-long friendship with each other. And so we write about our story and there are also interviews with experts and other people who are friends and other people who are our friends. And we really just wanted to take a look together at the relationship that we have with each other because we think that a lot of people have the kind of friendship that we have, which is someone who you know, the the best label to call it really is your best friend. But as we know, that can mean so many, 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 many different things. And we really wanted to talk about the importance of those kinds of really long lasting, impactful friendships. Yeah. And we also wanted to put some language to many of the experiences that we had within our friendship. You know, the fact that, right, this term best friend is one of the only words that we have for a, a super intimate friendship where someone might be as much a part of your life or more important to you than blood relatives or have, has known you longer than a spouse. We really wanted to elevate this relationship to the place that it it belongs in the sense of, you know, not all friendships are the same, but if you have one like this, here's some language that might apply to the situations that arise within it. And so our book is really about what's great about that, you know, why it feels so incredible to be intimately known in this way by someone who is a friend, and also many of the difficulties that arise with that, you know, like any intimate relationship, why it can be hard to really stay close to each other for the long term through a lot of life changes. I was actually surprised by the opening of your book in that the two of you were away at a spa and had come to a point where things were not perfect between the two of you. I thought that when I opened the book, it would be a whole thing about the perfection of your friendship. And yet you started it so openly and honestly that like, you know what, things, we had been collaborating for a while and and it wasn't always perfect. And you two even host a podcast together where you talk about everything and you come off as, you know, perfect friends and the pressure even behind that kind of performance level of your friendship. So tell me a little about the dips and how you got back to to closeness when you had that period, kind of a rough patch. 
Yeah, you know, I think that what's interesting about our friendship, or rather, I'll say this, I think that a thing that is true about our friendship that is not true of every friendship is that we are two people who host a podcast together. And so (laughs) it just means that a lot more people that don't know us can make assumptions about what our friendship really is, right? And so I think that that's just something to like get out of the gate. And it doesn't mean that the way that we do our show, I think that if you're actually listening really closely, you can tell is that we are just like two professionals who are good at editing each other. Like it's not a show about like, ugh, like I'm going to air all of my grievances or I'm mad about this thing that you did in private. So I'm going to talk about it on the show. That's just not how people who are professionals are. But I think that the idea that there is a kind of relationship that is perfect, whether it's a friendship or a marriage or whatever is, you know, that's just not true. Everyone knows that that is not true. And I think that what we were really trying to get to is, you know, how do we explain that, like all relationships, our friendship is not perfect and how do we make time to work on it not on the podcast because we actually do not, I'm like, I'm not working anything out that's personal on that podcast. And I don't think that that's the point of it. But, you know, I think that just like all relationships, we've had our our highs and our lows. And the thing that Anne said earlier about finding a vocabulary for it, again, is because in other kinds of relationship, there is really easy shorthand and really easy understanding of oh, like, you know, if you were married to someone or you're dating them and you say, oh, we're growing apart, everyone knows exactly what that means. But if you say that about your friend, what does that mean? You know, like, can you grow apart from your friend? Can you feel, you know, what are ways that you can try to save a relationship that you have with a friend? Is it okay to go to therapy? Or is that sound something like is completely extravagant? And so I think that we were just trying to have out loud a conversation that the both of us had been having in private for a really long time because by talking about kind of how our friendship works we are just trying to encourage other people to tell us how they're doing friendship right and I think that in I think we we say this very clearly in the book like we're not experts at all if we were ex like I don't think there's any such thing as a expert in friendships but we are two people who just really like each other and want to stay friends for a long time and the only way to do that is to be really honest about the fact that it's hard sometimes. Especially as long distance friends, which you two are as well. I mean, now I feel like with Zoom and all the rest, there's somehow more incentive to connect with friends from far away. But I feel like you two have been working on this for years now with the podcast and have really sort of put your stake in the ground as like not experts per se, of course, but just that you can do it, that there's hope for people who miss their friends who live far away. Yeah, I think that, you know, we have long had the belief that it requires a different kind of prioritization if your friendship is not in person. And often that's during the transition period, right? It's not so much once you're used to being far apart, because by this point, we are pretty comfortable long distance friends. You know, we know more or less like the ways we like to be checked in on and we know like how to kind of prioritize each other and let each other know that we're important, even though we are not seeing each other every day. But Those are things that aren't necessarily obvious if you've spent most of your friendship in the same place or in one context. And, you know, we've done a lot of thinking about this as it relates to the global pandemic that we're all in right now, wherein even friends who are in the same city are essentially long distance friends, you know? And, you know, really that challenge of how do you transition a friendship where, you know, maybe your routine in the past was that you always went to the same like exercise class together every week or you always like met up with each other after work or whatever it was once that changes you kind of have to say like oh what what actually is the way we check in with each other now and that is very similar to one person moving away and having to navigate that challenge is really laying some groundwork for other changes that you might have to navigate in a friendship, right? So like other big life shifts that might prevent you from keeping with an old routine. And so I think, you know, we've discussed it as really, you know, not to say that like there's anything good about, again, a terrible global pandemic, but it really is a skill set that if you want your friendship to survive, you have to figure out how to hone together. So true. You know, one of the parts of your friendship in the book that I found really interesting was when Aminatu got sick and was her diagnosis was unclear at the beginning. And I know Aminatu, you in the book were saying you were pretty private about it. And Anne, you kept trying to help and see what you could do. And was this really the end diagnosis and what could happen? And tell me a little more about how the two of you sort of traversed that challenging time together. And, and also, you know, what do you do when your friend 
when you worry about a friend and their health and yet you're not right there and you can't help, like what can you do? What's the best thing you can do for your friends? <laughs> it's a big one. Sorry. I know. Sorry about that. Uh, you, can, you can take that one apart, but you know, one question at a time. Yeah, I guess I think, you know, you're talking about a part of the book where we talk about this concept called stretching. That is really, you know, how do you, how do you just like keep up emotionally, physically, whatever with people that are in your life when two of you are just very different, right? And sometimes you have to stretch for very tiny reasons. Like your friend likes a kind of music that you don't like. And it means that every time in the car, they're going to play it and you just have to learn how to live with it. And sometimes the stretch is something bigger. Like your friend is, you know, they, they're moving across the country. How are you going to stretch to be there for them? And so one of the examples of stretching that we have both had to do is that I experience chronic illness. And it means different things for the person who is sick than it does for the person who, you know, is the friend. But I think that it's fair to say that it is challenging for both people in a way that unless you are open and kind of generous with each other, it just can become a real problem in any kind of relationship. And so, you know, on my side, it was a real stretch to, to say, I don't actually know what is wrong with me. I'm working with my doctors to figure that out. The diagnosis is not something that is neat and easy, but my life is very different in the sense that I can't do all the things that I used to do. Like I'm going to have to skip your wedding or I'm going to have to skip a trip that we had planned taking or you know, or just like, I'm just too tired to get on the phone to talk to anyone. And on top of that, just being really private and not wanting to have every single detail of my medical life just up for, you know, up for discussion all the time, you know, and, and at the same time, like I had to stretch in that it means that I had to ask my friends and my community for more help, right? Because I just can't take care of myself in the ways that I, I needed to do. And so this was a time in our life where we were both like, even though we weren't talking about it explicitly, we were both trying to figure out like, how can I stay friends with someone when my life is very different or when a situation that is happening that has nothing to do with a personal preference is there and we both have to learn how to navigate it. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, the flip side of that for me was feeling like, okay, here is a new situation that someone I love very much is dealing with, or maybe some new information about an ongoing situation. And I am 3,000 miles away, which means I can't do some of my normal, like, friendly, I'm thinking about you activities, you know, like dropping off some food on the doorstep or whatever. You know, I'm a big food drop-off person. <laughs> that is not possible from the other side of the country. And, you know, we had already by this point in our friendship been long distance for a while. You know, I think we kind of had a routine of how do we check in with each other, but that is really different when, you know, for example, like Aminatu is saying, like she doesn't want to necessarily give a full health readout to all of her friends. Like sometimes she just wants to catch up. And I respected that always. But at the same time, I'm like, I'm far away and I want to know what's going on with you and I care about you. And trying to really pull apart what is supportive of her and what is just making me feel more secure in the friendship. What do I need in order to feel like I'm still in an intimate friendship with this person. What does she need? These are the kinds of questions that we really, we kind of had to work through. And, you know, some of that is helped by knowing each other very well. We write in the book about how I know and love Aminatu. So I know that sometimes, you know, she will use humor to kind of gently deflect when she doesn't want to talk about something. And so if I noticed her doing that when I asked about something specific about her health, I had a choice to make, which was either kind of like explicitly keep poking or like kind of respect that she didn't want to talk about it just then. And I don't know that I have any like big picture advice, you know, in terms of what does it look like to support a friend? Because all of this is so specific to the friendship that you're in and to the people who are in it. And yeah, it, it really is one reason why we wanted this language of the stretch to be a part of the book, because then it's less about here is what you do, step one, two, three. And it's more about describing the kind of situation that is pretty likely to occur in every important friendship. Got it. And Aminatu, how is your health now? And not to pry into your private life, which I know you don't like talking about, but I don't know, having read it, I'm like concerned. So just wanted to make sure you were doing okay. Thank you so much for asking. I am doing great. Good. I'm glad to hear that. You know, another part of the book that I thought was pretty awesome was when you had come up with the idea of the shine theory and then 
somebody stole it and the two of you decided to pool your resources and just fight it legally and that you overcame the people who had sort of trademarked your original idea. And I just wanted to hear about that that story because it sounded like there was a lot more than was on the page about that one. Well, yeah, like Shine Theory really began as something that we spoke about and practiced within our friendship. And it was really not something where we were like going to make a concerted effort to unveil it to the world and announce it and be like, hello, here is our idea about why collaboration is superior to competition and why we always try to prioritize long-term investment in people. Like we did not have like a press conference where we rolled out this idea and thought, it was going to be a big deal. And so, yeah, we were very much taken by surprise when we realized that someone who we did not know, who we had not been in conversation with about this concept, had purchased the URL and registered the trademark for Shine Theory without our knowing it. And yeah, (laughs) that's sort of the, that is sort of the backstory you're referring to, I think, right? Yes, yes, yes. But then we sort of were presented with a choice about whether to just let that stand or whether we wanted this person who was really using it in more of a context of, I think she was like a fitness guru of some kind. I don't know. There were a lot of women's abs on the website that she had set up. (laughs) We had a choice whether to kind of let her continue to associate this very weird interpretation of what it is with this concept we had originated, or whether we wanted to fight for that trademark ourselves. And yeah, we chose the latter path. I don't know. Do you have any memories about this, Aminatu? I'm trying to like... <laughs> I No, I think that's very accurate to what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just like always like hearing about people struggling and working together to solve problems. And anyway, it, maybe there was not too much more to it than that, but I'm glad you persevered. So what was your process like of, of co-authoring this book? And I know you'd collaborated for years and years and years on your podcast, but perhaps a book in a different form, was a a new way of communication. How did the two of you tackle it and accomplish it? Yeah, a book is definitely, you know, is one of the larger projects we've done. I think (laughs) I can say it's the biggest thing we've had to deliver all at once. And yeah, it was, you know, it it was a lot of fun. And it was also really, really, really challenging because, you know, on the podcast, for example, we are able to work remotely where we don't have to be in the same place to do it. And with so much of the writing of the book, we did have to make time to essentially go on long stretches of writing retreats with each other. And the process is not unlike a lot of the other things where we do. We talk it out to death until, and then we go away in our own respective corners to, to actually do the work. And here, because we wrote in a joint voice, it meant that we had to outline it together. We talked about like what the stories were that we were trying to illustrate or the, the ideas that we were trying to bring to the forefront. We would go you know, in our separate corners of the room and write the assigned word count and then come back and edit that all together. Got it. And was it something that you would want to write? Like, did you enjoy it? Or do you want to write another book together? Or is it one and done? How did you feel about it? I will work with <laughs> Anne Friedman and all mediums for as long as she will want to work with me. I Aww. mean, the pleasure was exquisite, as was the pain. But like, I, <laughs> but I also don't know that that's any different than what anyone would say about writing a book, right? I think that I am extremely grateful to have had this other kind of window into the way Aminatu thinks and like really like works over an idea and also really just grateful for the opportunity to come to a joint understanding about what some things in our friendship have meant to each of us individually and also to us together. Because, you know, even if like no one really ends up reading or liking this book, like I feel really, really good about like what what this process has brought to me personally and what you know, what a gift it was for us to be able to examine our friendship in this kind of depth. Do you have any advice to aspiring authors having survived the process? Write a little bit every single day. That's my advice. (laughs) Amen. Okay. (laughs) Well, great. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for coming on Moms Don't Time to Read Books. You have made me, as I mentioned earlier, I now want to just call my best friend, even just the thought of thinking about friends in today's day and age makes things just seem so much better, even despite all the chaos and everything else. So thanks for even highlighting the importance of friendships and giving some tools to help navigate them over time and raising the origin story and just all the rest of it in your book. So thanks for sharing your story with me and with readers and good luck. 
Of course. Thank you so much for having us. Go call your friend, Zibby. I'm going to. I'm going to. My friend, her name's Jen. Anyway, I'll call her soon. (laughs) Bye. Bye, Bye. Bye, guys. Thank Thank you. you. Thanks. So that's it. That's the last day of the July Book Blast. That's the last of the Empowerment Friday episodes. Go back, listen to the last 10 days. There's so many amazing episodes. I really hope you've stuck with me and listened and sampled and gotten inspired to read more and gotten some great life tips along the way and above all felt connected through the power of storytelling. Thanks for listening. Thanks again for listening to my podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. If you liked this episode, please follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books and sign up for my mailing list at zibbyowens.com so you can always hear about the latest things I'm up to. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much to Page One Books for sponsoring today's episode. I hope you'll all check out my summer beach bundle at pageonebooks.com. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Thanks for listening. You could always email me at zibby at zibbyowens.com. Thank you.